This tank chat's going to be about this vehicle, the Schutzenpanzer Lang, or HS30, a post-war German armoured personnel carrier that has a bit of a scandalous story to it. Please remember to like, subscribe, or click the little notification bell if you don't want to miss out on these videos. And I'd just like to say thank you to all our patrons for making this possible. Please join them if you can. This tank chat's going to be about this vehicle here, the Schutzenpanzer Lang or HS30, or early in its production, it was called the Type 12-3. Um, now, it's a vehicle that has a fair bit of controversy with it because it led to a scandal in the German, West German government, in the procurement agency, uh, and it didn't have a particularly happy service life. So back to that post-war period, if we look at that 1955 when the West German army, the Bundeswehr, is being set up again, um, the German government actually promises NATO. They hope by 1960 they're saying they want to get about 12 divisions to be able to serve with the NATO forces. And that's quite a considerable sized military force and they're going to need equipping. So we've seen already how the Germans, they look at their own industry, they also look abroad to buy in or hopefully get gifted equipment to be able to use for this new Bundeswehr fair force. Now one of the things that happens is German industry at the time, even though there's this economic miracle in the post-war German economy, you know, it re-establishes itself very, very quickly, actually defence industries uh, are less quick in getting off the ground again. Um, and there's understandable reasons for that. There's still that sense of the hangover from the war and uh, uh, again that sense of uh, apology that's going on with the German government for what's happened in World War II. And equally, there's also restrictions on German arms manufacturer. So they are not allowed to export um, to foreign countries. So there's a reluctance there as well to take on military orders because there's no, there doesn't seem to be, apart from the Bundeswehr, that much of a future for it. Hence the need to go abroad or to look to other countries for assistance. Now, in uh, about 1955, Hispanio Suiza, who are based, uh, the company based in Switzerland at the time, have come up with a design for what is going to be an anti-aircraft carrier, um, a sort of track vehicle, armoured but with a 30 millimetre cannon to take down aircraft. Now that model vehicle, it's not actually built, but the German military look at that as a potential to turning into an armoured personnel carrier. And at the time they're also looking at the AMX VTP, the, uh, uh, basically the French armoured personnel carriers being offered to them. They're looking as well at the Americans later come along with the M59, but it doesn't work for the Germans because how they're looking at it, they see that their armoured personnel carrier is going to have to fit their doctrine of battle, which is very much along the lines of the Panzer Grenadier in World War II. And that means that the vehicle is not just there as uh, maybe the Americans and the British saw it, as a battle taxi to drop the troops off, to accompany the tanks, drop the troops off, and they finish the attack on foot. Actually, they want the German troops to be able to fight from the vehicle, whether that's in attack or in defence as well. So a different set of criteria really put forward for the German, the new German military. Now, it just so happens that Hispanio Suiza comes in with an offer on that vehicle that's a third less than the French AMX VTP vehicle that's being offered to them. So the German government asks, or the procurement agency, asks for a prototype vehicle. And that's, um, that first comes about in uh, March 1956. They put an order in for a prototype vehicle from Hispanio Suiza. That vehicle, before it's even delivered, an order goes from the German authorities for over 4,000 uh, of what they want of this new type of what becomes known as the HS-30 armoured personnel carrier, which is a bit of a risk, as you can might imagine. So that vehicle, when it starts getting built, immediately shows a huge number of problems to it. That's one of the first parts of what becomes a major scandal for the German military. The other issue is Hispanio Suiza, they haven't actually got the facilities 
to be able to build what's required in the numbers that are required. So without even acknowledging um, or informing the German government, they go to uh, Leyland in Britain and put an order in for 2,800 of these vehicles to be built in Britain. Um, they actually also go for a much smaller order um, to Henschel and to Hanamag to be built in Germany. But there was a, a, a desire from the German military. They are looking at potentially wanting to order over 10,000 of these HS30 vehicles. So that's a, a pretty sizable order. Now, the first production vehicles start arriving later in the 1950s and immediately the number of problems they've got um, it makes them almost impossible to put into service. Some of those problems are things like the suspension. Um, they end up breaking springs on the front of the vehicle. They have to limit its speed. It can go well over 30 miles an hour. They limit its speed to about 15 miles an hour or even less sometimes to go across country so it doesn't damage the springs on the front. The tracks wear out too quickly so they have to come up with a new track system. It turns out that the engine fitted is not really powerful enough because so many of these stories you've heard before, the weight um, goes up of the vehicle so that ultimately the engine is, doesn't seem to be powerful enough and it has huge problems in servicing that engine in terms of access, tracks have got to come off, all sorts of things have got to be done before you can actually really remove an engine from a HS30. Unreliable, uh, lots of other minor problems going on. So by 1960, the German government cancels the order. Um, it limits it to 2,271 uh, vehicles are actually uh, taken into service. The rest of the orders are cancelled and they pay a 40 million Deutschmark fee to Hispanio Sousa um, to cancel that order. But that's not the end of the story and we'll come back and see about that. Now, the reliability, they mentioned the problem, by 1965 these vehicles are in service, only 65% of them are actually operational. They manage with improvements um, and retrofits, etc. They managed to get that up to about 85% uh, by 1968. So uh, 1970s, early 1971, the first of the Marders start coming in to replace a vehicle in service. So what do you get when you get a HF30 uh, vehicle? So as we look at it, it's relatively thickly armoured for a vehicle of this generation, certainly an armoured personnel carrier. On the frontal armour, you've actually got 30 millimetres of steel angled at 45 degrees. So if you look at contemporary armoured personnel carriers, that's actually very effective in terms of armour protection. It's thinner armour, 15 millimetres, etc., around the sides and the rear. Um, as uh, firepower, they give this vehicle um, what becomes known as the HS820 cannon. It's a 20 millimeter cannon. It's basically a Hispanio Suiza design that's built under license by Rheimatal. It carries about 2,000 rounds of ammunition within the vehicle and it fires armor piercing and high explosive. It's really put there so that this vehicle, back to the German doctrine, the idea behind it, this can take on pretty much every other target other than a tank and that frees up your tanks to concentrate on the enemy tanks. So this, they give it 75 millimetre elevation, that's quite considerable, down to 10 millimetre, so it can take on things like helicopters, soft skin vehicles, other APCs, etc. That was the idea behind the firepower. It would also be fitted with an MG3 machine gun that would be fitted onto a pintle mount just behind the driver. The driver sits here on the front as you're facing forward. It would be on the left-hand side. You can see he's got three periscopes um, to look through there. There's a square hatch that opens. Behind him, another square hatch. That's where the machine gunner would sit with this MG3 machine gun firing almost over the driver's head, firing forward that way. The Tank Museum is a registered charity and every purchase you make from our online shop directly supports our work. We ship worldwide and if you subscribe to our email list, we'll give you 10% off your next order. When you finish this video, go to tankmuseumshop.org and you'll find something you never knew you needed. Now the whole point of the vehicle is an armoured personnel carrier. So, you actually have a gunner in the turret, that's the three crew members, but it takes five soldiers, a commander and four soldiers for that section in the back into battle. And they're in the rear area. 
Now, the idea of this vehicle, originally, there's a door on the rear uh, angled plate at the back of the vehicle um, with a small passageway that goes past the engine on one side. That was supposed to be a point of exit. But because of the issues with the engine, that kind of doorway passageway became almost impassable. So how the Panzer Grenaders were, were going to have to work in this vehicle is there's roof hatches that fold over and flop down the sides and your weight means of entry and exit is basically jumping off the side of the vehicle. Now, because of these hatches and the systems there, this vehicle does not have an NBC system, and that was considered, even early days, one of the downsides, because the German military are trying to think of this could be a chemical and a nuclear battlefield coming up in the future. Um, how are we going to protect the crews and the men inside there? Um, so fairly simple hatches go over the back. Now, the engines at the rear, and again, in Britain, they go to Britain, basically, and they get the B81, uh, the Rolls-Royce petrol engine, eight cylinders. Um, it's got about 220 horsepower, perfectly adequate. It's used on things like the um, Saracen armoured car. But again, in this vehicle, because the weight has crept up, it becomes an underpowered uh, engine system. And later also the transmission on this vehicle, they ended up having such trouble with the earlier transmission, they replace it with an American Allison transmission system. Um, so armor protection, good. Firepower, quite surprising. One of the things you notice about the vehicle is how low it is. And what we're looking at here is a vehicle that's actually about two foot lower than the contemporary vehicles going into service in the 1960s, vehicles like the M113. And this vehicle is often compared to the M113 because two foot lower, it weighs though about four tons heavier than an M113. And there's other issues that go with that. So this vehicle will only take five soldiers into battle an M113 they will take 10 soldiers. So that lower height is, is fantastic in the sense you're much less of a target for the enemy to hit. Um, it's again from, you know, targeting, that's quite an important thing when you think about your, your, what you're um, offering to the enemy to be able to fire at. But at the same time, if you've got to have two of these to take the same number of troops around the place, there's a downside to that. Now the drive goes to uh, the rear drive sprocket. You can see it's got five double uh, rubber coated road wheels uh, along the side there, springs on the front. The springs, by the way, were the ones that suffered a lot when they, they got rubber bush springed um, that suffered a lot. Rubber track pads that could be replaced on the vehicle, uh, again, because that was a legal requirement for German vehicles on the road. Um, it's not, you could forward in this vehicle, you can't go particularly deep, but again, the Germans, when they're weighing this up, they don't mind that as a problem too much because, of course, most of the tanks, they'd be using American M47 tanks, they're not going to be deep wading either, um, and these vehicles are to accompany their tanks in the attack. Now, because of that cut order, um, it ends up that the German Panzer Grenadier regiments don't end up having entirely kitted out with these vehicles. They still end up using lorry-borne infantry uh, as part of their force formation because there's not enough of them. Now, one of the other sides of this vehicle, so coming back to its kind of slightly scandalous story, um, not only has it failed in its early testing, it's not that good, it, it, it takes a, a while to get these things back up to a usable order, but it then turns out after federal investigations that the, um, the miraculous way that Hispanio Suiza put in the order that just so happened to be about a third less than its nearest rival uh, in terms of costing, it turns out that they got prior information, bribes had taken place, and certain politicians and people in the uh, procurement ministry were actually implicated. And there was a major report written on this, some of it you can read on the internet, um, because about how this failure of arms procurement. And again, from one of these vehicles, they, they went into service into the early 1970s, they start getting uh, phased out, they were used for secondary roles. They did build some other types of vehicles on this chassis, they, carry, they do a mortar carrier. They experimented, they did drawings for a whole range of a large number of vehicles based on the HF-30 chassis. Most of those never even got to prototype st uh, st stage because the idea was canned, especially because of this rather bad air that was around the vehicle, not just because it's economic or it's, it's failure as a, 
um, in, in its actual function um, and it's the, the need to keep investing in it to keep some sort of level of serviceability up but there was also the other side of the issue was that because of the corruption that was found behind it this became kind of like one of those scandal projects in the military and is often referred to and again from our point of view here at the museum it's one of the sort of like the downsides as you might call of the uh, the arms the defense industry is quite often in its history there's been the issue it's not that those young men or women going off to fight get the best equipment it's obviously we've mentioned before it's what that country can afford but sadly in some cases it's the equipment that somebody's been either offered the best bribe or the best possible job position when they leave that office uh, with a defence company and that of course leaves a pretty bad smell and a bad taste in many people's mouths especially when you see the politicians or high-ranking military sort of placing orders with companies and then miraculously in what seems a very very short space of time they appear on the board of that particular company they've given the order to. Um, so, interesting vehicle. We actually have the other variant, the mortar carrying variant here in the collection. This one here, it's actually in our reserve shed at the moment. It was a gate guard for quite some time. Looks a bit uh, tired around the gills at the moment. Um, but again, another one of those uh, vehicles that tells that post-war story, but brings in another element of uh, arms procurement.